Good afternoon. Welcome to the third event of our 2021 Power of Arts and Sciences Week. I am delighted that so many of you have joined us for the celebration. This year, our Power of Arts and Sciences series is inspired by our strategic plan, which we made public yesterday. In the plan, we define an exciting shared vision for the next 10 years, a time that is sure to go down in Washu history as the decade of arts and sciences. Our strategic plan is meant to motivate and create, to move us forward and to bolster the education we offer and the scholarship we produce. I hope you will take a moment to look through it I'm sure you will be inspired by our vision for the years ahead. In so many ways, arts and sciences is the heart and soul of Washington University. One important reason is that our curriculum touches each and every WashU undergraduate. And we take great pride in that responsibility. A major aim of our strategic plan is to expand student literacies and engagement through the liberal arts. Today's event will showcase what it means to the future of undergraduate education in arts and sciences. This conversation will be guided by Dr. Aaron McLaughlin, the Vice Dean of Undergraduate Affairs. Dr. McLaughlin leads the College of Arts and Sciences and she's also an accomplished scholar in Holocaust studies. She's truly our students' greatest advocate and biggest supporter. And I know she's excited to tell you about our innovative plans. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Erin McLaughlin. So thank you, De Dean Hu. Um, there are so many exciting things on the horizon for undergraduate art education in arts and sciences. And I'm excited to lead this discussion of some of the developments today. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. We'll start with some brief remarks by each of our panelists, and then we'll leave some time for a Q&A session. First, we'll hear from our panelists, starting with Renee Patrick Turner, Vice Provost of Admissions and Financial Aid, who will discuss the, the university's recent announcement of a need blind admissions policy and its impact on arts and sciences. This, this is super exciting. After that, we'll hear from Diana Silva Jose Edwards, director of the post baccalaureate pre medical program and coordinator of stem diversity initiatives. who will talk more about the work we are doing to achieve and maintain a diverse equitable and inclusive student community across all identities and socioeconomic backgrounds, especially in our STEM fields. Then we'll hear from Sarah Yu, Director of Academic Planning for the College of Arts and Sciences, who will present on experiential learning and short-term international opportunities for undergraduate students. And finally, I'll talk about our strategic plan pillar to expand student literacies and engagement through the liberal arts by emphasizing different literacies. So now I'm going to turn this over to Vice Provost Turner. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel. Um, uh, I think we're going to have a great discussion. And I, I thank you all for the invitation. And I thank you all for attending. Um, I am even more excited to speak with you about WashU's new need blind admissions policy, which was just implemented, what well, was just announced and we are implementing this year in the uh, admissions process. And I'll talk with you a little bit about how I think um, this will impact the enrollment um, for Washington University in general, but also for the College of, of Arts and Sciences. So to get started, I am going to share my screen. Some of you who, um, have heard me present before know that I rarely go 
uh, anywhere without some data. And so I do have a couple of data slides that well, one data slide and a few other slides that I would like to share. So I want to start out by sort of grounding us in what the arts and sciences undergraduate enrollment has looked like over the last 10 years. We have made significant uh, progress in enrolling uh, talented and diverse students over the over the last 10 years and it's exciting to be a part of a campus that uh, can attract so many talented students so you'll see over the last 10 years the enrollment of arts and sciences had just gone up about 500 students the first year entering class um, typically it's around 1100 or so this year we will admit that the class is, a, is larger than we anticipated um, we had a bigger response uh, to our enrollment models, difficult year with COVID to predict what students and parents were going to do, but just a really talented class that just joined us in September. You can see the middle 50% by testing. Um, we continue to enroll talented students if you use testing as one measure. I do wanna point out the top 10% in the high school. That number has gone down, not because of anything that we are doing, but because high schools across the United States have um, stopped ranking students. They, they um, don't like the, the, the competitive nature that it creates in their high schools and the stress. And so uh, fewer and fewer high schools across the United States are, are ranking. And so that accounts for um, that decrease. But our percentage of Pell students, which is a proxy for the students coming from the lowest incomes in the United States, our first generation students, our underrepresented students of color. And when we talk about that here at WashU, we talk about Black African American students, Latinx students, uh, Indigenous students, um, uh, Native Pacific Islanders. And you have, can see how that percentage has increased significantly over the last 10 years. And when you add Asian American students, the total percent of students who identify as students of color in the College of Arts and Sciences is 48%. So it's just an incredible um, uh, group of students that we've been able to uh, attract and make these improvements over the last 10 years. So we are doing well, but there's some areas where we're not doing as well. Uh, students who seek out WashU and apply to WashU prior to our need blind announcement, um, we had more students who have the whose families have the ability to pay the WashU tuition. We have fewer students, probably around. 36% or so who are on financial aid and compared to our peers, about 40, 45% of our peers are enrolling students who are on financial aid. Um, we have seen a decrease in the percentage of students who are enrolled, um, who come from families that may be considered coming from moderate in incomes. We've seen a decrease in that. And so the excitement of the, the announcement that the chancellor made um, in October, it was just really, really exciting. Um, as some of you may recall, when, the, when Chancellor Martin was inaugurated back in October of 2020, he announced that he wanted WashU to be, uh, have a need blind admissions policy in due course. I think unbeknownst to him and everybody else, uh, we didn't expect that due course, that in due course would be today, which is really exciting. Um, because of, uh, of over a very positive investment return, the university was able to invest $1 billion in financial aid, which allowed us to be need blind immediately. The admissions team and I are in the process of evaluating the applications, the early decision one applications and regular decision applications that have come in. And we, for the first time, are not considering whether or not a student has applied for financial aid as we are making our admissions decision. So it is really changed the game for what we are doing. Um, students apply, everybody has their file read, the most competitive, competitive files go to our admissions committee. Prior, last year, prior to the need blind announcement, we would separate the files. So students who applied for financial aid would go to one committee and students who did not, 
would um, go to another committee. But today, 100% of our students are considered for admission, and we are not at all focused on their ability to pay. And it is exciting. Now, we hope that over the course of the next few years, we're going to begin to attract students. Students will be applying to WashU um, knowing they'll choose WashU knowing that financial aid, whether they're applying for financial aid, knowing that that will not have an impact on, that, on their admission decision. And that's going to change the population. We expect to have more students eventually who will enroll at WashU who are receiving financial aid at the university. We expect that we'll be able to continue to diversify the university in terms of having more students who are first generation students in the class, uh, enrolling more moderate income students, um, enrolling, continuing to enroll students from the lowest incomes in, in the United States. We are one of the best institutions in the country and it is so important that we are able to attract talent to WashU regardless of uh, that student's background. And that is just some of the most exciting work that my team and I uh, will be able to do over the course of, of the next few years. So stay tuned. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have at the end of the panel discussion. Thank you, Vice Provost Turner. Um, now we'll hear from Diana Jose Edwards. Good afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us. I am so happy to be here today to talk briefly about the frameworks and efforts um, going on at the university for promoting STEM diversity, and mainly just the, the amazing conversations I have had with colleagues for the future of this space. And I hope to share a little bit of, with that um, with you today. So as my title mentions, um, I'm coordinator of STEM diversity initiatives, but I would say our focus is really on STEM equity and inclusion. We can't realize the benefits of STEM diversity without equity and inclusion as well. So in terms of our framework, how can we provide equitable opportunities for all students to have a rewarding educational experience in STEM at WashU, especially as our demographics of our incoming students are changing. And to do so, how can we be intentional and proactive about creating systems and supports towards this goal? And so like Rane, I also am, am um, generally equipped with data. So I just wanna share a little bit of, that with, of data with you all. So I think as a starting point towards this goal is really an awareness and acknowledgement of where we are and where are our gaps. Um, and I'm showing as an example, some data from the class of 2020. And we have about equal numbers of students that enter WashU with an interest in majoring in either a non-STEM or a STEM field. But when you look at the majors of these students at the fourth semester, Fewer students who entered WashU with a STEM interest major in STEM than their peers who had a non-STEM interest. So, you know, why the focus on STEM? Because you would expect students to change their minds once they've begun taking classes and exploring those interests and the richness of a liberal arts education. But this is more acute for students that have a STEM interest. And furthermore, with equity in mind, the migration away from STEM is not the same for all students. Minoritized students, particularly female minoritized students, leave STEM more than majority students. And I'm just sort of showing some of the various identities that our students have. But given these gaps, we need to do further work to understand how the STEM experience at WashU may not be equitable and, and because we're missing out on the opportunity to develop the full spectrum of STEM talent here at the university. So this is a strategic priority for us. So there has been excellent research done on psychosocial constructs that can affect persistence in STEM, including scientific self-efficacy, so the feeling that one can do science, scientific identity, I am a scientist, and sense of belonging. So as we look to the future of arts and sciences and the institution, 
how do we actively and intentionally foster scientific self-efficacy, identity, and sense of belonging in all facets of the student experience? Student-centered approaches to support success are one facet to promote STEM equity, but we can also consider changes in institutional practices and behaviors to create a more inclusive STEM learning environment. And all of the things that I'm showing here are conversations that I've had with my colleagues informing this sort of shared vision to move forward in this space. So particularly in the student-focused space, there have been several issues efforts on which we can build and expand, such as academic resources like peer-led team learning, um, and also the first year summer academic program that provides participants a head start on coursework and community prior to entering their first years at WashU. Speaking of community, social networks can enhance sense of belonging and persistence in STEM. And we have a few cohort-based programs that have been successful at building peer-to-peer -peer relationships. But how can we scale those efforts or think about other places to foster them, such as course-based near-peer mentorship? And one of our great strengths at WashU is the ability for undergraduates to do research and other experiential learning experiences. The feeling that one can do science is fostered by actually doing science. How do we make these experiences available earlier? Um, sort of before you have that major de declaration, for example, and remove the barriers to participation, such as having paid experiences. But as I mentioned, student-centered approaches are necessary, but not sufficient for change. How can we reimagine and reconfigure the STEM learning environment to make it more inclusive? And STEM, speaking as someone that's trained as a scientist herself, STEM is unique in that overcoming obstacles and embracing failure are inherent to the practice of STEM. Failure is an opportunity to learn something new. How can our STEM learning environment explicitly explore this versus the fear of failure that some of our students have? So active and experiential learning in courses, but also assessment and grading approaches, as well as time for assessments and assessment types is one mechanism for a more equitable learning experience. Many faculty, particularly in the introductory STEM courses, have been doing excellent work in this arena. And STEM is interdisciplinary, both within fields, but also with connections to public health, the social science, and many other fields. Are there new majors that can actively foster this interdisciplinary change? So for example, those students that migrate away from STEM, many go on to major in the social sciences. Instead of either STEM or social sciences, how can we have both and, and in turn widen our pool of who participates in STEM? Another aspect is being explicit about what are our values in STEM, in STEM education, and how do we um, articulate those values at our university? For example, inclusive teaching. How is this measured? How are resources allocated? And how is it awarded and communicated? And lastly, how do we define success in STEM? Traditional me measures of merit can recapitulate existing racial and, and other inequalities. Thinking about collective core competencies and more flexible pathways on how to fulfill them is maybe a way to the future of a more equitable STEM learning environment. So we have both immediate and long-term goals to address these um, particular facets of the educational environment. And I am heartened by the conversation um, that I've had with members of our WashU community about all of these goals. And I look forward to translating those discussions into actionable ways to enhance STEM equity at WashU Wash through an iterative awareness, assessment, accountability, and recognition of where we are and where we want to be. So thank you, uh, Dr. Jose Edwards. Um, our third speaker is Sarah Yu. Thank you, Erin. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Diana, when you get a second, oh, there you go, great. I will share my screen. Awesome. 
I am excited to speak with you today about some of the initiatives in arts and sciences that will enhance experiential learning for undergraduate students. So over the course of creating the 2021 strategic plan, one idea we heard time and again from across the arts and sciences community is the distinctive power of the arts and sciences to prepare students to be informed, active participants in a rapidly changing society. As the plan's sixth pillar on the liberal arts tells us, our high achieving and highly motivated students consistently ask for exposure to the probing questions and programs of study that will enable them to build lives of meaning and impact and to engage the world in fulfilling ways that serve not only individual but collective well being. In other words, as I see it, what is so critical about a liberal arts education is that it is not just learned but lived. And a key facet of our mission as a liberal arts college is to build clear pathways for students to extend, expand, and practice their learning both within and outside the classroom. Looking ahead as arts and sciences works towards equitable outcomes across our student body along key indicators of academic success. These include, for example, graduation rate, career or graduate school placement, GPA, and the student's perception of their own learning. We are also making it a priority that all students be able to take advantage of experiential learning opportunities that can substantially influence a student's learning, engagement, college satisfaction, and future lives. So firstly, what is experiential learning and why is it important? Numerous studies have shown that students who participate in activities such as research, study abroad, community engagement, and internships see gains in learning outcomes, personal development, and the capacity to engage in deep or integrative ways of thinking. Often called high impact educational practices, these activities not only increase student success and persistence to graduate, but also create a higher chance of students leaving college equipped with the kinds of knowledge, literacies, and skills ready to make a positive contribution to the world. Our strategic plan identifies experiential learning as a key priority for undergraduate education. Today, I will share with you a few examples of how we plan to build on our existing strengths by leveraging and growing models of experiential learning that are already in place in arts and sciences and exemplify what we do. So of all college experiences, study abroad has proven to have profound transformative potential for students in developing a global perspective and intercultural competence through the lived experience of spending time abroad. In addition to the semester long study abroad experience, we are diversifying the ways that our students engage with the globe and global issues academically. Firstly, we are, we are expanding opportunities for faculty-led short-term international study travel through our ampersand program, the signature programs offered for first-year students in the College of Arts and Sciences. As small, multi-semester courses that can involve field work, research, or international travel, ampersand programs are designed to provide a coherent, group-oriented learning experience by bringing students with similar intellectual interests into a close mentoring relationship with members of the faculty. Currently, seven ampersand programs include faculty-led study travel, a number we aim to increase substantially. Because these programs require a significant commitment of time and effort from faculty, not all of them will be able to run every year. And our intention to increase the pool of programs has the aim to provide any entering class with a number of options to choose from. In the Global Citizenship Program, for example, students, students explore how their own mental maps compare to the realities of a globalized world and how language plays a role in refugee settlement within the legal, healthcare, and educational system. Led by three instructors from different disciplines, cohorts enrolled in this year-long program have traveled to Japan, Costa Rica, and the US-Mexico border, among other destinations. In the second semester of the program, students also experience what it means to be a global citizen at the local level by engaging in a community-based learning project with St. Louis-based organizations. International experiences embedded in the first year curriculum open the door for students to engage in long-term study abroad programs later in their college careers. This is something we have seen by tracking ampersand cohorts longitudinally through time. As part of the ampersand program on the history, memory, and representation of the Holocaust, 
co-instructors Vice Dean Aaron McLaughlin, pictured here with students in Berlin, and Associate Professor Annika Walka, traveled with students to Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. Of the 17 first-year students who took this course in the 2017-2018 academic year, all but one went on to pursue a semester abroad in their junior year. We are making an explicit effort to scale up the ampersand program model because it is designed to provide early exposure to international education, especially to those with little to no prior experience. We believe it is critical that all arts by students have a chance to develop their cross-cultural perspectives through engagement with new environments, beliefs, and people. At the same time, we acknowledge that not all students have had the exposure to international opportunities that some of their peers gained prior to college. Our job then is to identify and work to dismantle barriers related to a student's identity, background, and experience, and to value in turn the diverse perspectives and capacities that our students bring to WashU and to the world by creating an inclusive learning culture. For this reason, we are committed to making sure every student can participate in ampersand study travel, regardless of their personal network or financial situation. Students receive need-based financial support from the College of Arts and Sciences, according to funding levels determined by student financial services. Other innovative models in arts and sciences that we plan to expand are intended for students to generate a deeper mastery through research, internships, and community engagement abroad. For example, the Wash U France for the Pre-Med program includes internships in a hospital or other global health-oriented organization in Nice. Students enrolled in this intensive five-week summer program set their pre-health studies within a broad intercultural framework and gain experience not just by crossing over a geographical border, but into a different health system entirely. The WashU in Chile program offers practica for psychology students, as well as the option to pursue a credit-bearing internship in place of one semester long course. We plan to explore intercultural health and medical shadowing pathways with our institutional partner in Santiago. As we develop and promote experiential learning opportunities abroad, it is a priority that we ensure equitable access through financial aid, scholarship resources, or other support. We are exploring the possibility of a passport initiative to ensure all entering students in arts and sciences have a passport, set the expectation that they will use it, and communicate early on in their studies the benefits of global engagement. We're also considering international experience seed funding for aid eligible students to support an experience in a location outside their country of residence. Also, in order to build robustly scaffolded experiences for all students, we intend to enhance these activities through pre-departure programming and coursework in language and culture studies, and to support deliberate reflection and continuity of learning through post-program workshops on re-engaging with the St. Louis community or collaborative post-program research projects or presentations. And last but not least, we hope students will integrate the global perspectives they gain in their senior capstones and senior projects. I want to conclude by saying it is a privilege to work with our students. I am consistently struck by how committed they are to affecting positive change in the world. And I believe it is our role as educators to endow students with the capacity to grapple with the interconnected realities perpetuating global inequities that occur at local, regional, and global levels. I'm excited for the future of experiential learning in arts and sciences, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Erin, I pass it back to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Yu, Sarah. Um, now I would like to speak about what we're calling the Literacies for Life and Career, which appears as both a pillar and a signature initiative in the new Arts and Sciences Strategic Plan. With this initiative, arts and sciences will incorporate a literacy-based approach into the undergraduate curriculum in order to provide students with a set of literacies and competencies that are indispensable not only for their future careers, but also for their roles as engaged and responsible citizens and for their well-being as private individuals. This innovative educational approach focuses on the acquisition of diverse sets of skills and knowledges necessary for successfully navigating a complex, ambivalent, and rapidly changing world. This includes 
media, narrative, and visual literacies, scientific, technological, and environmental literacies, numerical, computing, and data literacies, a solid grounding in ethics and civic responsibility, a substantial familiarity with the diversity of human cultures, both past and present, a nuanced understanding of social and economic structures and of global dynamics, critical thinking and problem solving competencies, facility in oral and written communication, and leadership skills, intercultural competency and creative de dexterity. That's a long list I know. Literacies for life and career will leverage the existing arts and sciences curriculum on all levels to help students hone communicative and analytical skills and achieve facility in, facility in complex discourses and knowledges. Importantly, it cuts across the disciplines in the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. In fact, any given course from any corner of the arts and sciences curriculum might combine diverse literacies that supplement its main disciplinary focus. By drawing students' attention to the ways in which their coursework transcends their major and indeed even their preparation for a specific career, this approach will make the larger, more holistic goals of their education more transparent to them and assist, assist them in translating the knowledge they have acquired into concrete competencies attractive to future employers. Moreover, Literacies for Life and Career aims to better prepare students to meet challenges they will face not only in the workplace, but also in their engagement with critical sectors of society by helping them to develop into responsible and ethical agents. This approach thus embodies three overlapping objectives. First, it encourages students to prepare thoughtfully and intentionally for their future careers by capitalizing on the strengths of their liberal arts education. Second, it enables them to imagine and build future lives of meaning and impact. And third, by equipping students with long-term tools for navigating the world's complex problems in informed and nuanced ways, it aims to produce arts and sciences graduates who are ready and able to act as a positive force in the world. Through its existing liberal arts curriculum, which requires that, arts, uh, that undergraduates take courses across the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, arts and sciences already embodies the rationale of this literacy-based approach. So in many ways, this is not a radically new or innovative endeavor. However, while many arts and sciences courses may, and in fact, more often than not, do focus on a number of different literacies and competencies, they are typically organized around single scholarly disciplines, such as biology or American studies or sociology. Students thus take them in order to learn the fundamentals or advanced concepts in biology or American studies or sociology. One consequence of organizing and classifying courses according to scholarly discipline, however, is that students aren't always aware of the skills and knowledges that they're gaining above and beyond scholarly subject areas. They know what the overt topic of the course is, but they don't always know what additional proficiencies they might gain in the course, especially knowledge or skills that may be relevant for a career far outside the subject area or for their informed understanding of the world around them. And faculty who after all are experts in their respective disciplines aren't always prepared to communicate the ways in which their courses transmit broader expertise that is applicable to students' career preparation and engagement with the postgraduate world. Literacies for life and career will encourage both faculty and students to reframe how they regard the liberal arts curriculum. On the one hand, this approach asks faculty to identify, augment, and signpost particular literacies that exceed the subject matter or disciplinary focus of a course. On the other hand, it will make students more aware of the fact that in addition to learning disciplinary fundamentals, 
they're also gaining broader, more practically applicable literacies and competencies from their coursework. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. My colleague, Abram von Engen, professor of English, and incidentally, one of the co-chairs of the Arts and Sciences Strategic Planning Steering Committee, is an expert on 17th century American Puritanism. He regularly teaches a 300 level course called City on a Hill, the Concept and Culture of American Exceptionalism, which focuses in large part on the Puritan origins of American culture through exploration of foundational texts. Students learn about Puritan history and political thought, but they also gain some grounding in the crucial economic organization of Puritan society, which helps them to understand some of the most fundamental economic concepts that underpin contemporary American cultural and economic life. His course thus transmits a form of economic literacy. A second example is my own course in the ampersand program on the history, memory, and representation of the Holocaust, which Sarah cited earlier. That course, which explores the representation of the Holocaust in literature and film, is organized around a series of ethical questions and dilemmas crucial for understanding the Holocaust. Thus, although the seminar's disciplinary home is literary studies, it also introduces students to core concepts in ethical thought. A third example is a first year college writing course that is taught by Jen Smith, Vice Provost for Educational Initiatives and Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and Nathaniel Farrell, Lecturer in College Writing. Entitled Citizen Scientist, the course teaches the fundamentals of argumentation and rhetorical analysis through exploration of the dynamic interaction between environmental science, politics, journalism, and the public. Here, in addition to narrative and media literacies, students gain an understanding of how scientific research is conducted and evaluated, as well as familiar, familiarity with core environmental concepts. The literacies for life and career approach will make legible this kind of cross-cutting acquisition of literacies provided by existing courses within the arts and sciences curriculum, as well as to encourage new courses that combine disciplinary, disciplinary areas and diverse literacies in innovative ways. Our objective is to introduce and integrate this initiative in an intention, intentional and sustainable way with the aim of gradually shifting our academic culture to a literacy oriented model, rather than forcing an overnight transition to it. This will require the substantive, substantive input of a steering committee that represents the breadth of arts and sciences faculty, as well as consultation with instructors across the disciplines. By offering incentives, we also plan to engage early adopters who can help develop best practices and serve as mentors for additional faculty. We will begin with first year seminars and other lower, lower level courses, many of which already feature the acquisition of diverse literacies, and then gradually extend the approach to upper level major and capstone courses. The key principles here are, again, thoughtful integration, intentionality, and sustainability rather than disruption or change for change's sake. After all, undergraduate education in arts and sciences is already top notch. Our goal is thus not to revolutionize, but rather to fine tune. As we begin to implement literacies for life and career in the classroom, we also plan to draw students' attention to their individual efforts to develop their own literacies and competencies. In particular, we will integrate into our comprehensive four-year advising practice exercises in which students articulate and reflect on their acquisition of literacies so that they can begin to craft a narrative about the knowledge and skills they've gained, which they can then take into their postgraduate lives and offer to potential employers. In other, word, in other words, we will encourage students to foster a kind of meta-awareness of the larger objectives of their liberal arts education, as well as to deliberately track the fulfillment of these objectives. 
Okay, so I've done my literacies for life and career, um, and I think it's time that we can open up the floor to questions. I'm sure our attendees have a lot to ask about all of these initiatives, and if you have questions, you can put them in the question and answer uh, section uh, of the, of the um, Zoom call. So I'm gonna start with our first question that's come in. Um, that is about the uh, uh, admissions process, specifically about um, the test optional practice. And I think a, a Vice Provost Turner will be uh, the right one to answer this. Uh, but the question is, now that Stanford, Columbia, Cornell, and University of California schools have announced that they will continue to be test optional, will WashU follow suit? When, that, when would that be announced? So thank you so much for that question. That's a great question. Um, I am aware of the Stanford and the Columbia announcement, but I have not yet seen the Cornell announcement. Obviously, I'm also aware of the University of California announcement. A uh, University of California system has made a decision to di discontinue using standardized tests in their admissions process um, indefinitely, although I did see a story that they might be reconsidering it. Uh, Stanford and Columbia's announcement was related to the next admission cycle. Um, and so, and I, I'm, I haven't seen Cornell's, but I would guess that theirs is also related to the next admission cycle. They have not made the decision uh, to be uh, permanently test optional. So what are we doing at WashU? Well, we are aware of the timeline where high school juniors want to know if we will be test optional next year. And uh, we are working to um, examine the data. We've had one, one class that has entered, the class that just entered this past September is the first class that has enrolled at WashU uh, under our test optional policy. And we're gonna look at some data as we get grades and we will announce a policy um, sometime at the start of the spring semester. Uh, that would be my wish as long as we get all of the appropriate permission. So thanks so much for that question. Thank you, Renee. Um, the second question goes to you as well. Um, how does need blind admissions help bring individuals coming from moderate incomes? Is WashU offering more aid for those of moderate incomes who don't qualify for Pell Grants? That's another great question. I began my presentation um, at a place where, at a level where I, I probably should have backed up a little bit. One of the things that I think is really important for everybody to fully understand and embrace is that WashU, since before my arrival in 2016, for a long time, we have met 100% of demonstrated financial need for any student that we admit to the university. So if we admit a student to the university and they have need, we will give them a financial aid package that will meet that need. As we have focused previously on increasing the percentage of students who are Pell eligible at the university, and as we have um, focused on our need aware admission policy, um, a lot of our financial resources, which had a specific budget, were focused on students from the lowest incomes and we did not have enough resources left over for students who um, we weren't able to admit students who um, may have been uh, in moderate income at the numbers in which we would have liked to. So under the need blind policy, the university is giving us a financial enough of a financial aid budget for us to admit the most compelling, the most well-qualified students that apply to WashU, regardless of whether they've applied for financial aid. And we think that um, this will benefit some of our moderate income students that we weren't able to admit in the past. Great, thank you again, Renee. Um, our third question is, and I'd like to encourage people, I see more questions showing up in the, uh, uh, the question to answer. That's great. Um, we have time for some more questions. Uh, our next question is, what percentage of students are DACA recipients or students who may otherwise be unable to obtain the passport uh, initiative, you know, a, a passport for travel um, that we're hoping to um, increase the possession of uh, amongst WashU students? 
Um, that question I'm going to also give to uh, Vice President Rose Turner in that um, that kind of data is, is not the easiest data for us. Uh, those of us who work with students, we don't have access to that data that's uh, considered incredibly private uh, data. And I think um, uh, Vice Provost Turner can talk about it more in the aggregate uh, than it, with regard to indivi individual students. Yes, we are aware of students that are undocumented and um, also DACA students that um, are that apply and are admitted to the university. And we will fully support through our financial aid programs, those students as well. Uh, I'm not gonna give you a number, it's a small number. I don't know the number specifically for the College of Arts and Sciences, but we do have access to that information. And I don't know if Sarah wants to jump in and talk a little bit more about how you, how you all, if a student can't get a passport, how you all will manage. Absolutely, thank you, Rene. So really some of the new strategies around um, supporting international education are not just you know, based in experiential learning, but really come out of many lessons we've learned in COVID. And I would say it's in the space of virtual learning opportunities. So for many students who for any given reason may not want to have a study abroad experience where they go abroad and in some cases quite frankly, students just choose not to do this. It's optional, strongly encouraged, but not a required aspect of the undergraduate experience at WashU. So we are exploring some new initiatives. Nothing is set in stone yet, but one idea that we're thinking about is opportunities to partner with international partners to develop mutually beneficial programming. So for example, we're considering virtual courses that could be co-taught by WashU and international partner university faculty and would enroll students from both WashU and the partner institution. There could be group projects where the students collaborate from both campuses. And these courses could actually culminate with a symposium, a simulation or a project that is actually simultaneously exhibited on both campuses, so would not require international travel. It's also possible that these courses could culminate in an activity that involves embedded travel, like an ampersand program, to the partner institution or to a third location. So secondly, we are also thinking about, and I was recently in touch with the Director of Overseas Programs about this, virtual international internships. So this is a really interesting, an interesting notion that I personally had never thought of until COVID. So I, I think in brief, we have some new opportunities that are kind of on the horizon that are coming out of the lessons we've learned from COVID. So more to come. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, our next question is, um, what are a couple of key teachable moments WashU will carry forward, forward in teaching and learning for the long term? Um, and I have to say that uh, that's a pretty broad question, and it's kind of hard actually to always know what students take with them into their postgraduate lives. It's often idiosyncratic, but I can say um, that students really respond well to the kind of experiential learning uh, opportunities that both um, Diana and Sarah um, mentioned, um, those that get them on the ground, um, working with, you know, working on research, working with objects, working um, in, in a different culture, those are a highly impactful. Um, and I would also say that for me, thinking about this MOOC going forward, um, my kind of uh, focus on this literacy really developed in the days after the, uh, almost a year ago, in the days after the January 6th uh, attack on the Capitol, where I uh, really believed that universities have a duty to um, prepare their students to engage with what is a very complex world out there. Uh, scientifically, we need to be able to have students who can understand the COVID studies that are uh, being conducted right now on Omicron, right, and understand why they're limited. Uh, we need to know why students, uh, and students need to know how vaccines are tested and approved and at different levels, what the difference between CDC approval is and FDA approval. We need students who understand the nuances of the uh, constitution. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And I think for me, this idea of caring forward 
is really about taking what they learn here and applying it in ex extremely considered and thoughtful ways um, in what will be without question a very complex world and landscape. Uh, we, we know it's not going to get uh, easier or more simple. We're not going to go to a healthy on time. It's gonna be harder and we want students who are prepared to deal with that. And I think that's um, sort of my answer to um, what we're doing with the literacies uh, initiative. Okay, back, this question's back to Renee, um, which is good. Well, we're so lucky to have um, uh, Vice, Vice Provost Turner with us, uh, helping us understand um, all of this for arts and sciences. The question is, do specific high schools and activities of an applicant hint at a po student's possible income level, would that still be considered need blind? And I think that idea, I mean, I know that a lot of people are, are that word need blind sounds uh, as if it means that we're blind to students' needs uh, altogether. And it's actually, it's kind of a different uh, interpretation. So maybe uh, you could explain that a little bit more. Yeah, that, that's a really great, great question. And, and I'm gonna start by saying, um, as I tried to describe in my opening comments that the admissions process that WashU used previously we had a financial aid budget. We admitted students until we uh, reached that budget. And then for the remainder of, class, of, our, of our class and fulfilling the, the admitting the remainder of the class, we would look at students who had, uh, who did not need financial aid or who, not, who did not apply for financial aid. So now that we are a need blind institution, we are evaluating applications with no knowledge as to whether or not a student has applied for financial aid. Now that question lends itself to a broader discussion about um, socioeconomic disparities in the United States and access to opportunities that students have as a result of their socioeconomic background. Um, we might see an applicant that plays ice hockey and you know that ice hockey is my daughter used to play us ice hockey and we would spend a lot of money on equipment <laughs> and all of those things. So you know there there are some activities that may lend itself to um, us understanding that a student is coming from a more privileged background. Um, and, and that that really can't be helped because um, that's the way the world is. What we do in our admissions process is we look at the applicant and we look at the opportunities and the experiences that they've had and what they've done with those opportunities and experiences within the context of their background. Um, but what we are no longer doing is we are not considering whether or not they've applied for financial aid in the admissions process. I hope um, that helps. And if you wanna have a longer discussion about this at another time, please feel free to email me and I'd love to talk with you about it. Okay, and then we have uh, one final question. Um, what do you see for the future of the humanities at WashU? We seem even in this presentation to be very STEM focused. And I believe Princeton, for example, ex for example, eliminated its classics offerings. Um, I would say here that um, first of all, um, uh, we're STEM focused, particularly uh, with uh, Dr. Jose Edwards uh, presentation because STEM is a crucial area for our underrepresented minority students, for first generation students. Um, this is uh, a place uh, where students, they, they flock wanting to enter STEM focused careers. And it's often uh, a challenge as she pointed out that for students to actually gain a foothold. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a particular area of focus, but it's not the only area of focus. And in fact, I think my literacies, as my literacies um, uh, discussion indicates, and as um, the experiential learning discussion indicates, the humanities have a central importance to what we're doing in a liberal arts education. And I can say that our classics department here is one of the strongest in the country. It has great enrollments. We're not getting rid of classics. The, the, the humanities are, um, in fact, if uh, one looks at the university strategic plan, there are a lot of initiatives that particularly impact the humanities. Um, the focus on um, 
uh, the, the research and teaching folks focus on racial equity, for example, the uh, Center for Literary Arts, for example, there are a number of initiatives, not just this literacy, uh, literacies initiative. So I wouldn't say at all that the humanities are being um, uh, disadvantaged um, uh, at the expense of STEM. Um, in fact, I think we're, we're really um, uh, pumping up the humanities and Dean who has definitely given uh, his commitment and support to them. So um, actually, we're getting close on time, um, and uh, I want to thank you all for joining us um, for your interest in undergraduate education at Washington University and for celebrating the power of arts and sciences with us this year. Uh, as Dean Hu mentioned in his welcome, uh, the new strategic plan for arts and sciences was just made public, and we'd like to end this um, uh, panel by sharing a video that celebrates our new vision for arts and sciences. It's super exciting. So a link to the Strategic Planet uh, website is also in the chat. And I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Enjoy the video and enjoy the rest of your day. Our campus sits near the confluence of two ancient rivers. Ecosystems merge and thrive in our midst. Our region has seen diverse cultures take root, fight for survival, and reach toward greatness. A host of resources, historical and cultural, innovative and intellectual, enrich our work. They draw us to engage with our city with each other and with communities around the globe. Our school, Arts and Sciences, represents a convergence of ideas, ideas that shape our understanding of the world and indeed the world itself. We will elevate scholarship that is creative and ambitious by embracing new ideas, emerging technologies, and shifting paradigms. We will honor and promote the pursuit and discovery of knowledge. We will seek distinction in cutting edge scholarship and push boundaries both within and among disciplines to meet the most critical challenges facing our communities and our planet. We will find new ways to tell our story, to share the matter and meaning behind our work. We are an institution devoted to bringing people together to serve the public good. Our partnerships here in St. Louis and across the region will identify shared goals, and we will pursue academic and educational excellence that positively impacts our communities. We will forge critical connections from the local to the global, expanding solutions, and imparting lasting impacts on the world within our own community. Faculty, staff, and students of all identities will feel valued, represented, and equally empowered to pursue their goals. Here, we will create meaningful connections with our peers, our mentors, and the St. Louis community. We will gather knowledge and learn how to apply it to build lives filled with meaning and purpose. We will go out into the world as engaged, active, 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 active and impactful members of our communities. Together, our voices will rise to shape the next decade and all the decades to come. We are ready. The time is now. Welcome to the Decade of Arts and Sciences.